should know. Hello. Hello, everyone. So we, we will be starting in about a minute or two as people are joining. Those are good graphics. Oh yeah, I wasn't quite sure um, how how best to sort of build up the story. So we've been posting these on social media, just yeah. leading up to try and generate some interest. Yeah. How many people have joined? Uh, we got 22 participants on right now, plus uh, you, myself, and and That's, good. That's good. Yeah, we have 100 people on the sign up sheet. We'll see how many actually attend. Well, Nathan, it's uh, 12.01. You want to kick things off? Yes, let's do that. So um, just begin by saying welcome, everyone, um, to this session of um, Global Fridays. So Global Fridays is um, a, a series of talks that, um, a seminars that are organized at the uh, University of Northern British Columbia. We try to connect global issues to issues that are of importance to Canadians in general. And so that's, that's what, so today we are very happy to be collaborating with the newly established, um, you know, CIC branch in Prince George um, for for this particular day. But I have to also begin by acknowledging that the UMBC is located on the traditional territory of the Lake and we are very privileged to be able to share the, the land um, with 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 this this group of First Nations. Um, so I wouldn't be saying too much. I am a member of the Global Fridays Committee, but today is the big gig for the CIC Prince George branch. So I will hand it over to the first president of, of this um, organization to introduce, but also to moderate the rest of the session today. Sean, there you go. Awesome. See me all right? Am I coming up? All systems go? Awesome. Well, welcome everyone to today's talk with Phil Calvert. Uh, my name is Sean Simmons, and I'm president of the newly formed branch of Canadian International Council in Prince George. I'll be moderating today's talk with Phil. And let me say how excited we are to have some experience to talk about the future of trade with China. Uh, but before I make the pass off to Phil, I'd like to share with you a bit about our new branch and hopefully entice some of you to become members. Uh, to start, let me say that when it comes to having a wealth of international experience, I'm not that person. My experience is primarily focused on the sport fishing market, but as far away from international issues as one might imagine. Our, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> I'm talking about tourism, for example. Anyway. Oh, that's a great example. Okay, well, thank you for correcting me, Phil. Well, I, I know that I, I do have a deep interest in Canada's place in the world stage, and certainly recent events, particularly in 2020, I made it apparent that I need to get better connected with the rest of the world. And so that is a key motivation on why I wanted to set up a branch here. Now, fortunately, when I started approaching other people in Prince George that I know, uh, many of them shared the same thoughts that I did uh, about learning more about Canada's place on the international stage. Uh, for example, uh, Nathan Andrews, who just gave the introduction, um, Jacqueline Haller, both uh, from UNBC's international program, were on board right away. Uh, John Kaysen, who I've worked with on previous boards, is also keen to learn more. And rounding out our core support team is local counselor Garth Frizzell. And we've also had help from Hannah Hett, a recent grad of international studies, who has helped with our social media and will be live tweeting today's event. Uh, please use the chat to ask questions, and Jacqueline Haller will be handling those questions uh, once we get into the Q&A. And I should also announce, we, we were... Uh, like providing a, uh, an incentive for people to uh, share our tweets, uh, signed copy of Claws of the Panda by Jonathan Manthorpe. Unfortunately, we ran into some difficulties uh, tracking down all the people who retweeted and reshared. Our apologies there. But what we're doing in the interim is we're going to take a list of all the attendees today 
and at the end of the talk, uh, uh, do a draw on, uh, on, on who will get a copy of the book, and we'll send that to you. So without further ado, let me give you a brief intro on our speaker, Phil Calvert. Phil grew up in Prince George and is a graduate of Prince George Secondary School. He spent 34 years in Canada's Foreign Service with three postings in Beijing, including as Deputy Ambassador, as well as an assignment as Ambassador to Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. In Global Affairs Canada, he was Director General for North Asia, Director in the Trade Policy Branch, and Deputy Chief Negotiator for China's accession to the World Trade Organization. He is a Senior Fellow at the Centre for Asia-Pacific Init Initiatives at the University of Victoria, and a Senior Fellow at China Institute at the University of Alabama. Phil, it's a real pleasure to have you here today, and I'll pass it off to you. Thanks, Sean. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and thanks for inviting me. Congratulations to the CIC Prince George uh, on setting up the branch and having his first uh, this first activity, it's the beginning of many of many, uh, I think, uh, activities that CIC will be involved in. I think it's it's uh, gonna it has a great future. Um, before I actually get into the presentation, I want to mention the Prince George roots thing because this is uh, quite important to me. Um, I grew up in Prince George. Uh, went as you meant, as Sean mentioned, went to Prince George Secondary School. Um, and if you think that a teacher doesn't have an impact on your life, then then uh, then you're thinking wrong. Uh, for me, uh, uh, my uh, history 12 teacher was Keith Gordon, who uh, unfortunately passed away many, many years ago. Um, and uh, he was the one who first got me interested in China, um, first introduced me to some Chinese, some Chinese history, and uh, got me my attention focused on that part of the world. And so uh, from there, I went on to UBC and did studied Mandarin and did some Asian studies and that sort of thing. And, Eventually, ended up in the foreign service. So, so that is, uh, you know, my my ch interest in China grew from my time in Prince George uh, in high school. So, I think that's important to to acknowledge. Um, so, what I'm going to do here, I have a presentation. I'm going to uh, try to run through it fairly quickly. I like to keep this as informal as possible, and I'd like to um, start by by uh, I'm going to make a few general comments about Canada, China about China's economy, uh, and then go into the trade, the, the issue of our trade relationship where it is. And then I think step back a bit, a bit and look at some of the global challenges that Canada faces uh, uh, in, in dealing with, not in dealing with China, but the global context of a Canada-China relationship. And that uh, fits in, and then some suggestions from it of what, what this implies for us. So I'm going to now go and try to start my presentation, and I hope I'm not completely uh, luddite or klutzy here in getting it going. Here we are. Uh, here we are. And that seems to be working. So if that's working, if that's not working, let me know. But uh, I'm going to uh, wait. Pardon me about this window down here, but there you are. Okay, so this is a title, Canada China Trade and, and Investment in a Changing Global Environment. I like this photo because uh, uh, it, you, I think I see, there are many photos of, of uh, Prime Minister Trudeau with our leaders, with Chinese leaders. This one looks like they're trying to figure each other out and not sure about each other, which is kind of where we are right now in a lot of ways. Um, so uh, next, sorry, oh, that's back, I gotta go back here. Ah, what's happening? Let me show you. Let me get out of this for a second, and I'll try to get this going again. I'm having. Okay, okay let's go back. I'm not sure what happened here, but I will get this going again. Uh, slideshow. Okay, so I want to start off talking about perceptions because uh, each of us in China and Canada have perceptions of each other and how we work. But I think sometimes can get in the way of actual uh, the re reality of how we uh, uh, of our of our, uh, our connections and what the reality is. And so here here are some perceptions that we tend to have about China. Uh, one that is monolithic, 
in fact, when it's in fact a very complicated and complex country with leadership that is a kind of a coalition of different factions. So, so, so it's not the monolithic unitary, monolithic unified unitary state that people think it is. Uh, there are differences, regional differences, uh, differences within the Chinese Communist Party. So it's quite complicated. The second uh, perception that Canadians have is that we have a special relationship with Canada because of uh, Norman Bethune and that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, ignore that completely. We don't. Uh, it's a nice thing to talk about, but really, although we had, uh, you know, we had uh, established relations with China early, and although we've had, you know, many uh, foreigners doing good things in China and and, that, and sold wheat to them during their difficult period, uh, that doesn't really have an impact on. Canada in China, uh, and we tend to fall back on that sometimes too much. Um, we tend to want to project our values and interests in China, starting with missionaries uh, uh, and all the way through in different times in our relationship. Uh, we wanted uh, missionaries, uh, Canadian missionaries in China, wanted to turn Chinese, Chinese people Christians. Uh, sometimes uh, that didn't work very well, but they did some good things. Uh, when China joined the World Trade Organization, I think a lot of people thought that as being okay, China is going to become like us. Because that's one of the, what I'm really saying here is that the, the idea that China wants to be like us and, and they don't. Uh, so, so we tend to project some of our values and our perceptions onto what, how we see China and we start seeing China the way we'd like it to be and not the way it is. And finally, on a, especially on the business side, the connections are the key to success. Um, I say that because uh, in doing business in China, and I have to warn people now that I haven't done business and haven't worked in China for a while, but the, the idea that that's all you need is to know someone whose uncle is uh, has a cousin who uh, you know, has a relationship with the premier, that'll get your stuff done. Uh, that now is, uh, that's, that's while personal connections are important, that, can, that idea that that is what you need only uh, is is not true. What businesses need in China are uh, are price, uh, you know, price value, uh, service, uh, and sorry, and uh, and that's and price, value, and service. So um, I didn't turn my phone off. Um, uh, so anyway, that's so. These are some of the ideas, the perceptions we tend to have. Uh, perceptions of Canada by China, I think two really important things. Uh, one is that uh, th there is an inherent suspicion that is inc inculcated in Chinese education and Chinese leadership about what the West plan is for China, that there is a long-term strategy, and this was long before uh, Donald Trump, to undermine China, to, to convert China, to get, undermine the Communist Party, uh, and that sort of thing. And they see Canada as part of this, sometimes, I, sometimes a proxy for the United States, uh, and and that, not that we have any kind of independent foreign policy. The second thing that China sees about us is that we're basically a cold Australia far away. We're a source of resources, and they don't think about Canada very much as one, a country that has technology or good wine or that sort of thing. Um, so, so that's... I'm now going to just talk about China's economy a bit here because uh, there were some factors are there that were uh, slides that were shown that give us an idea, but I want to uh, uh, just highlight a couple of things. One is, of course, China's uh, economy uh, in terms of the size. That's why people are interested interested in it. Um, interestingly, uh, its growth uh, forecast for 2020 is at uh, two percent, which is a long way down from. The forecast, of course, pre-COVID of 6.2% growth, uh, but certainly better than most countries right now. Uh, it, as of last year, it was 70% uh, of a global economy. And really what's crit crit critical here is that China's production um, processes have changed or its, its economic role has changed in the last two decades to become central to global supply chains. Uh, for Can so this is important for Canadian, Canadian business just for doing bilateral trade with China, but for production in China. This is a very delicate, there we are. I wanted also to mention then, uh, as before we get into the actual trade issue, what the trade impact of COVID-19 has been in Asia, uh, because I think this is kind of another, another important context for us. Uh, it was kind of a unique uh, a shock that hit the world uh, when China uh, shut down with COVID because what happened was there was a supply shock 
propelled by a demand shock. The demand shock being, as China came out of COVID, uh, the first phase, uh, European, North America uh, countries went into it. So first of all, uh, uh, economies couldn't get supplies from China, followed by economies themselves shutting down in China and exports uh, shutting down. So, so uh, this had a, a tremendous impact on growth. And of course, we're still in the middle of this. We don't know exactly how things are going to work out. But China was the epicenter of this. And as we know, uh, but it also started emerging early into recovery, which is a recovery stage, uh, which seems to be uh, uh, happening still, as we see from the projections for China's growth for this year compared with other parts of the world. Well, what this really did was do three, uh, two, two or three important things. One, it highlighted the issue of supply chain resilience. I said that China was uh, central to global supply chains uh, and, uh, and, of course, exports of intermediate and capital goods to, to the world, including, including Canada. Um, when those shut down, a number of countries uh, uh, looked at another the countries, and especially companies, I should say, looked at. Uh, realizing that they had some severe vulnerabilities in their supply chains. Uh, they weren't getting information out, out of China, they weren't getting any, any product, had an impact on their production capacity. And so uh, this has drawn uh, attached uh, uh, or uh, highlighted to many countries the importance of, of uh, having more uh, 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 capacity to adjust to some sudden shock like that. What this has meant for China, for the region, is that a number of countries um, have been looking at moving, doubling up their supply chains and moving some production capacity out of China. Uh, uh, this was started in, with, with American companies already had, I'm sorry, American companies already started this and they did um, uh, because of the uh, um, uh, sino us uh, trade battles, Apple and Google and a few other countries were opening up um, production in, uh, in uh, Vietnam and Thailand and Mexico. Um, so this kind of this when COVID hit, this accelerated this process to have other countries looking at this. Um, now this isn't to say that Vietnam or Thailand or Mexico are going to replace China because China's production supply chains and production chains are very complicated. Uh, it, no other country has the capacity to to make so many things, has the infrastructure, but it does mean there's going to be more diversification to other parts of the world, and and that has a, a limited or. A, resulted in a slight decline in China's overall global exports because of the way these supply chains have shifted. The second thing that happened was this pressure to reshore critical industries, in other words, bring them home. Kind of a, a resurgent economic nationalism, medical devices were the obvious ones. And these, while when COVID was uh, taking place, when it was unfolding, this led to a lot of countries putting in export restrictions on their medical goods, other threats or other protectionist policies. Um, if this pressure continues and people, uh, countries really want to establish these industries, uh, these uh, industries, which may not be economic, it may not be an economically um, uh, rational uh, undertaking, but it's a politically uh, important undertaking. This could possibly uh, lead to more protectionist measures and undermine some more of WTO disciplines. Um, and then before we go, one more thing I wanted to mention is you know the 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 Meng Wanzhou and two Michaels issue is something that just hangs over the relationship right now including the trading relationship uh, we know the story everyone is familiar with uh, Meng, Wanzhou, uh, Meng Wanzhou was uh, detained and is going through an extradition process that will carry on for quite a while uh, uh, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig were uh, are arrested and I will say quite clearly in retaliation for this it was a clear retaliation by China for this arrest uh, and, and this has thrown our relationship into a tailspin. And that, of course, has implications across the board. But as we'll see, maybe uh, um, implications for trade as well as implications for political relations. And it's something we have to navigate. And we actually have to find a, uh, uh, since this isn't going to change for a long time, we have to find a, a, a rational way forward. Um, so let me go to Canada Chan Trade because uh, you've had some good graphics up as we were coming into this. So a lot of the export issue figures you see of this, just to give you a position of some where, where, uh, where this is or give a sense of where the trade uh, relationship is. So as of 2019, it was 8.2% of Canada's total trade, 4% of Canada's 2019 exports and 12% of our imports. So in terms of export markets, and this is something that, especially Ottawa, in sort of rethinking or thinking about uh, 
Canada-China relationship. I think you know there's one thought that it's not that you know four percent of Canada's uh, exports, uh, their second largest trading partner, single trading partner as a country, well four percent isn't that much, uh, and so maybe we can, you know, uh, uh, not be held as much hostage to it as as we think. But I think we also have to keep in mind that uh, there's a regional component to this, while maybe 4% of, uh, of uh, all of Canada's exports. It's uh, 13% of BC's exports we're talking about wine and, uh, and forest products and uh, some seafood as well. So, so there's, a, uh, there's a direct, more in, uh, strong impact in different parts of the country uh, uh, on, on, uh, on the state of trade with China compared with the overall impact. Um, uh, now, there was this big drop in bilateral goods. Uh, there was China has its capacity to respond and control uh, imports in, in such a way as to uh, deliver political punishment. This happened with canola. Uh, there were issues with beef and pork, which were more technical and, and maybe less uh, nefarious, but our trade uh, dropped. But what is interesting for 2020, halfway through the year, uh, we basically haven't dropped uh, below uh, what our level was at the same time, 2019. So in July, uh, 2020, July 2019 levels are about the same. This is compared with trade to the rest of the world. This is really important, and this and this reflects essentially, from what my understanding is, a significant purchase of uh, ores uh, from Canada because China's uh, involved in a stimulus pro program that uh, uh, involves a lot of construction to keep people working and to to get the economy going. So that is resulted in a number of uh, significant imports from China on the metals and minerals side. We have bilateral uh, and uh, bilateral trade and services relationship, but it's still pretty limited uh, considering when you consider the scope of the services industry in Canada and in China, the important role they play in our economies, uh, our services uh, trade back and forth is, is minuscule. Investment, similarly, our investment is not that high compared with uh, um, uh, the way it could be. Uh, and, and so the overall message of this for me is this is that uh, you know there's a lot of some trade going on, but it doesn't really live up to the potential that it could be uh, even be and and there's a lot more that can be done. Also, I want to note there the, the role of Canadian uh, Chinese content in Canadian products uh, as part of Canadian production as well. Um, well here are we. So just a, a couple of graphics I want to show. What, um, what we're looking at in terms of, uh, of Canada, you know, China and Canada's trade, just to make sure that you know there's some understanding here. Uh, this sort of tracks the non major not main non U.S. trading partners um, yeah, from 2000 to 2019, uh, and where it fits in all our goods, uh, exports, imports, goods and service. So you can see that there's been a steady increase in China's uh, role uh, in Canada's. Uh, uh, um, uh, economy and Canada-China trade, but um, the uh, 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 when you look at it, all of this, there's still clearly that uh, when you take off, since the EU is uh, our se our second largest trading partner as a group, the importance of the American economy and the importance of the American uh, uh, um, uh, uh, trade is, is overshadows everything else, and this is something we have to. Keep in mind from a policy perspective. There's uh, just a graph of our Canada our trade with China exports and imports in 2019. You can see the sharp drop in 2019, or that was basically uh, uh, in, in response to the decline in our political relationship and China's reactions. Um, and some of this has come back, of course. Uh, China, uh, and I think to remember with this, two things. One is that China will buy when it needs to buy. There is this. This slow uh, cutoff or sudden drop in some of our pork imports because of some labeling issues, but China was facing a, a huge uh, crisis in their pork supply, so they have ended up buying uh, more from Canada, a lot more from Canada. In the end, this, uh, the exports went up again. But you see the, the growing the gap that's grown between our imports and exports. Um, and this is, this is an interesting economic question because a lot of uh, of uh, people, including politicians, especially and ministers, when I dealt with them. I like to see what we export, what we import, and if exports are, better than, are higher than imports, then that's good, and if imports are higher than exports, well, that's bad. And it's really not that simple. Um, uh, uh, 
in a, in a in a perfect world where access was perfect uh, both ways and there were no sort of impediments or no uh, um, um, uh, 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 no, no impediments to trade and systems are both open then uh, and imports means that your people are able to buy uh, high, a lot of the imports as I said from China are imports that also come into our own production and manufacturing processes so they're important um, but that said uh, you know that one of the there is also there's not equity in access and China's access Canada's access to China does not have the same uh, it is not equal to China's access to Canada in terms of regulations and transparency because there are a number of problems with the Chinese uh, with, with the Chinese system and here's again I mentioned investment here's well how investment has unfolded over the last uh, couple of decades um, and this has um, um, as I said, it looks figures are in, in billions. It, it, it's in, have some impressive years, but uh, really, could be a lot more could be happening. Uh, and and just to highlight, and I, I will apologize. That a lot of people who have a lot of China experience and know this already, but I wanted to highlight this as I mentioned because we talk about the trade in, in balance. Uh, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, Challenges for Canada in dealing with China. Oh, dealing with China, um, economic nationalism is, is has grown and is growing. It's being used by the Chinese government uh, uh, to uh, uh, follow their own uh, uh, course of development, which is much has become uh, in in uh, a, in a bit of a reversal from uh, economic policies of the uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping period or the economic policies that he drove. Uh, in the last the first couple of decades of reforms, much more state-centered, uh, much more support of, of state industries, and this economic nationalism made in China 2025 uh, is focused on innovation, uh, high, uh, high technology, and uh, uh, supporting Chinese uh, companies, state-owned and others, uh, and this is done uh, at the expense of foreigners, and there it becomes it has become a real barrier, in, and in that sense. Um, uh, as the China-U.S. trade conflict has carried on, uh, uh, and with um, problems with um, problems with uh, the uh, uh, as U.S. has has put in place certain um, uh, measures against Huawei, against uh, especially the, the the banning the sale of micro of, of, of chips, microprocessors, any American ones made with any American technology to China. This creates a real problem, and this has stimulated even more uh, interest in uh, China making its own uh, 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 technology, increasing even more its own technological capacity, so it doesn't rely on imports. So this is what's happening. That makes it a challenge for us. The Chinese system itself is arbitrary, uh, uh, lacks transparency, predictability. Um, it is uh, often very difficult to navigate. Uh, and sometimes people do very well, but they're also, uh, it, it's a very challenging place. And uh, linked link to that is a limited application of rule of law in China, if at all. And so so this um, uh, uh, makes things, it gives the government a, a tremendous capacity to politicize trade decisions, to so say, we're not going to buy a certain product in this country. Um, uh, you know, if, if and I was a trade officer, if I went to the CFIA and said, well, let's not buy any more Chinese apples until they do something for us, they'd be thrown out of the room because they just don't, don't work that way. But this is the way that China has, uh, is still able to do this, to, to make politicize its trade decisions uh, based on its desire to punish our country. I'm also going to go to uh, two other issues here, human rights and the rule of law. And, and that is um, um, uh, important, and I think we tend to, when we deal with China, we tend to sort of try to separate the two, trade, try to separate trade and human rights, and keep these apart. Um, this is uh, understandable. It's the way people conceive of things. This is, and, and business people will say this is a political issue, uh, and we don't want to get involved in that, and we just want to do our trade. And that, that's, I mean, I can understand that. But I think we also have to recognize that China is disregard of some international legal standards. You know, um, rule of law does undercut activities of Canadian businesses. Whether you're talking about uh, contract and property rights, discrimination against foreign firms, intellectual property theft, corruption, limiting the on personnel, limit, limits on hiring international and uh, local staff, uh, 
uh, inconsistent non-transparency licensing approvals, restrictions on travel. These all fit into uh, the situation uh, and of course restrictions on communications. So these have an impact on bis doing business as well and so we have to keep that in mind. Um, the other side of it too is that uh, you know investment in China. I, I believe that investment in China as Canadian companies with Canadian companies who operate in China they actually can model human rights behavior, the way they treat their, their, their companies or their, their employees uh, and their, their uh, uh, environmental law and that sort of thing. And Canadian companies have visited Canadian companies to be a point of doing that. And the final challenge I think for, or that I'm mentioning here with respect to Canada's China, challenges with China don't aren't in China, but they're in Canada. Uh, I think we still lack a lot of institutional competence uh, on China, our capacity to, to understand what's going on. Um, there are a number of really people, uh, people with a lot of great knowledge about China in global affairs uh, and in some of the provincial governments and, of course, in businesses, but it's not ingrained the same way it is in some other countries. It's not part of our, of our uh, understanding and education uh, as much as it could be. Uh, institutions like banks and the Export Development Corporation, et cetera, et cetera, all could have a lot more uh, presence, not just, they're not talking about Chinese, like just Chinese language skills, but Chinese understanding of how the system works and how well to best to navigate it. There's a, still a gap in that, I think, across the board in Canada that we need to address. Um, as we're talking about trade with China, I want to just flag the issue that be on the table. Uh, and, and pardon me for my competence here. I'm going back the other way. A free trade agreement, free trade agreement with China. Now, this is all over the news uh, when the uh, 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 the Liberal government came in and Trudeau's uh, visit to China. Uh, it was politically and economically driven, but it didn't start with Trudeau's. It actually started with, uh, under the Harper government, China suggested a, a, a free trade agreement with us in 2011, um, uh, uh, suggesting this would be a good way to strengthen our economic ties. Uh, China really wanted it not so much because they wanted an economic, they thought that it would be extremely beneficial for China, but they thought, saw it as a political statement of a, a, a free trade agreement with a G7 country would have been a, an important to them, an important kind of statement about how, how China's place in the international trading system and the rules. And so they, they were quite keen on it for, for several years. And in fact, they're still talking about it. The last Canada China Business Council meeting, the Vice Minister of Trade uh, uh, mentioned they're still interested and they want to pursue this. Talks were almost launched in 2017 during uh, Trudeau's visit there, but essentially came out because uh, I think Canada misread China's signals on this. And it gets back to what I said earlier on about projection. Um, the issue was labor rights. And uh, I think from what I understand, what happened was that there was still a belief that China would sign on to the labor rights uh, um, principles or ideas or um, demands that Canada, ha that Canada had. And, and there was a, just a lot of surprise when they didn't, except from people who actually were working in China. Or new China. So, so once that didn't happen, things fumbled around. It really got going. Again, people start thinking about it again because you're thinking about dealing, having a free trade agreement with a country without rule of law or a fully convertible currency. You're, you're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, that those are it has a lot of limitations. Um, and now, of course, in the current political situation, climate, that's it's just not going to happen. We're not going to move ahead with that. It's uh, I think people have had a, a second look at China. Um, the, the whole uh, uh, Michael situation has, has sort of highlighted, I think, a bit the darker side of dealing with China. And uh, there's just no political uh, appetite for doing this, I don't think, in any in the Liberal Party, certainly not in any of the other ones. Uh, and when you talk about free trade with China, too, I want to just to f mention Australia's free trade agreement. They, they signed one in 2015 with, uh, with China. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't very ambitious. It, it was basically about goods and uh, tariffs, a few other things. And uh, and uh, if, when I was studying this or, or investigating this, uh, Australian officials used to, would say, and I was doing this in 2017, 2018, they were looking at it and saying, "Wow, our trade has really taken off since we had uh, our exports to China have really taken off since we had uh, a free trade agreement." Look how they just they just climbed. You can see from the, the graph I'm showing you there that uh, they have uh, they've taken off, but but when you look at actually what they are composed of, it's really not so impressive because the, the top line is overall Australian exports to China in 2009 to 2015. You can see 2015 there. 
and uh, and how uh, when it does starts moving up shortly after that. But uh, when you take out iron ore, uh, the lower bar is the one. The lower one is the exports without iron ore. Um, this it, it shows you a different story. And why this is important is because iron. There are no tariffs on iron ore, and it's the, Australia's main, main export. So when you take that out of the picture, um, the, the impact on on uh, there never were tariffs on iron ore. There never uh, uh, so there was never part of a free trade agreement. You take that out of the picture, and trade really hasn't sort of jumped the way uh, the in, in, the way it uh, you know, was hoped to do. It was hoped that it would by this by Australia, uh, simply because uh, uh, the the uh, you know the, the access base still remains an issue, and there still remain problems in, in dealing with China. So finally, uh, I, I mentioned back going back to political tensions. It's not just about the nosedive in bilateral, bilateral relations over the Huawei and Meng Wanzhou issue. There are, of course, ongoing security concerns. Um, and uh, uh, there's mention of Jonathan Manthorpe's book, uh, Clause of the Panda, which highlights some of the activities of the United Front, uh, Chinese Communist Party activities in China. So, so this all means that uh, uh, that uh, there's no really no real return to normal that's going to happen. Normal by I mean the way things were before December 2018, when things were moving forward, and uh, it's probably a very healthy thing. Not that we have a bad relationship with China, but that we need a more realistic relationship with China. And I just don't think we're going to go back to the pre-2018 days uh, because attitudes have hardened on China. And people are looking are looking elsewhere. So what I would say with the, with respect to the impact on trade, that trade will continue. As you as I as I mentioned, you know, we've seen uh, trade uh, at least this year uh, doing um, you know relatively well compared with the rest of the world. Um, that is related to some certain specific developments in China. But even if it does continue. Uh, I don't think that the big ticket items that require huge investments or huge projects that require essentially leadership, leader to leader promotion, uh, I don't think I don't see those happening, uh, that happening for the next while. And so, so uh, the question becomes, what do we deal with? How do we handle the trade, uh, trade with China um, in the future? Uh, before I, I want to just mention a few global challenges that we're facing as we deal with this, because this has an impact on. On, uh, on, uh, on how Canada positions itself with respect to the rest of the world and how we should handle China given this global context. One is the shift of the economic center of the gravity to Asia. And this is something, of course, we have uh, all know about, but this comes from an HSBC study, actually, and other projections about what the world will look like in 2030. Uh, this is, of course, estimates pre-COVID in terms of development, but frankly, we have to see how the pandemic unfolds, but I don't see it having a huge impact on certainly the top uh, ranking. So you're seeing uh, China in terms of the size of the economies, uh, the top five economies uh, being China, US, India, Japan, and Germany. And the big news is India's you know, rise to, to prominence in the, as, a, as an economy, but also where the biggest uh, movement upward is. Uh, and all that is in Asia, mostly South and Southeast Asia, where the big uh, uh, economic growth is going to take place. These aren't going to be sort of major world economies in 2030, but they're going to be higher up the higher up the chain. And that is significant in terms of what our trade planning should be like. Uh, and then demographic changes, are we going, we're seeing a kind of bifurcation of, of, of demographic changes happening in the region. We're seeing aging populations in North America, Oceania, China, Japan, Thailand, uh, by 2030, 60, uh, 25% of the Chinese population will be over 60, Japan 32%, Thailand around 20% as well. So a lot of this happening at the same time, when I mentioned population growth, what I'm seeing is in other parts of Asia, a younger population. And that's so when we talk about population growth, I really should be seeing a workforce. So, so uh, growth of workforces and population growth in these areas while the other uh, parts of the world and parts of Asia um, age. And then urbanization, which is hugely important uh, as if this, if this trend continues. So the housing demands, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at, um, I'm looking at the figures here. Um, uh, uh, 
urban po urban populations by 2030. Urban populations by 2030 will be estimated to be 950 million in China, 600 million in uh, India, 375 million in Southeast Asia, and with a lot of mega cities as well. So the the impact of this with respect to demand for electricity, power. Uh, sanitation, urban management, et cetera, is going to be tremendous. And this is another thing we have to be taking into consideration when we look at how we approach China, and how we approach China in the context of Asia, because that's what I, I'm thinking we should be doing. Add to that are the climate and water crises that we're facing. We know about climate change. I'm not going to get into this, uh, of course, in any, in any degree, but the things to think about, of course, is that Chinese greenhouse gas emissions are going to continue to rise. Until 2030, China is putting a lot of work into into this now, into reducing it, into uh, addressing uh, um, or has been addressing uh, uh, standards in factories. But of course, uh, the economic imperative uh, trumps uh, the, the environmental imperative still, and, and uh, so there's um, just the need to keep people working to keep employment up. And uh, another issue, of course, is competition for water, and this is something some, sometimes something of isn't on our radar screen, but we're seeing the Himalayas uh, melting. I, I, glaciers in the Himalayas melting, mostly in Tibet, having an impact on five major rivers in Asia, supporting a billion people. Uh, you're going to see more flooding, then more drought. Yangtze and the Mekong already are seeing major problems because of uh, not just climate change, but damming, huge damming issues in uh, on the Mekong, which dams by China, dams by Laos. Uh, that are having tremendous impact on water flow already and are going to continue to do so, especially if the water flow itself decreases. And then um, nationalism, I'm not going to, uh, just the, the impact of nationalism on, on the relationship too, because what to me, what this means for Canada is not, is, is and I'm, or I'm using Donald Trump hugging the flag and Xi Jinping's China dream as examples of this, but what this means is, uh, you know, these are uses. We all know the, the leaders can use nationalism to garner support when they're feeling threatened or weakened, uh, feel, feel domestic challenges. And, and this has uh, driven certain uh, decisions by both countries with respect to how they're, they're placed in the international order. Um, I think the American, uh, the nationalism anti is also tied up with anti-globalism, uh, anti-globalization. It's all kind of melted together. And... Uh, uh, that has an impact on the on, on uh, the WTO, uh, the China, the U.S. The U.S. impatience for the WTO is uh, and, and just like of uh, globalism has an impact on weakening these institutions. I think uh, at the same time, for example, uh, China's uh, you know ignoring of international justice, uh, uh, international court decisions on the South China Sea also because that has impact uh, effect on their own nationalism. Also, it's something to be worried about. China's growing reach as well is something context that was sorry. Um, I'm getting here. There we are. Oh, there's a benevolent looking Xi Jinping, uh, the World Economic Forum in 2017. Uh, you know, China is real stepping out on the global stage in such a way to to fill what they see as a gap left by the United States. China's in globalism, internationalism isn't that necessarily that benevolent. Uh, you see the Belt and Road Initiative, which is, of course, uh, uh, large infrastructure, focus on large infrastructure building across uh, Eurasia and Southeast Asia. Um, uh, it has led to, uh, uh, there are some major challenges with it. One of, one of the purposes is simply to get construction, Chinese construction work going around the world. But it also has led to uh, is leading to indebtedness and economic problems with some of the countries and countries in which they're with which they're dealing. So that's another concern. And of course, China's national security law is reflects both their less benevolent uh, uh, outreach or reach in the world, their their uh, behavior. So that is all of concern to us. China itself faces its own challenges, though, and I want to mention that because China is not. Uh, invincible or inevitable. Uh, the U.S. trade tensions are having a tremendous impact on it. They're trying to shift their economic model to uh, kind of a more uh, consumption-based, and that it has its own uh, challenges as well. Face a lot of environmental degradation issues. They haven't really. They're, they're doing. They're coming out of COVID, but the, the services industry remains very flat. Second, and while the three major cities are doing uh, are, are 
recovering apparently well so far. Secondary cities still have employment challenges, employment, their employment challenges across China, whatever the figures they tell you are. And I'm going to mention leadership as well because sometimes people don't think of these. Um, the, uh, uh, Xi Jinping is a new leader. Xi, the, Xi, Xi Jinping in China is very different from China under other leaders. It's more nationalistic, as I've said. It is uh, walking away from the kind of uh, private sector based uh, encouragement of the private industry to a more uh, government based one. And its projection of its power under Xi Jinping, as I mentioned, is, 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 uh, is sometimes disturbing. So, uh, so the, the other part of that is that China, Xi Jinping has abandoned uh, Deng Xiaoping's maxim. Um, Deng Xiaoping, uh, having gone through the Cultural Revolution, having worked, you know, uh, in part, seen Mao in action, really was concerned about uh, the need for leadership transition. That when you become a leader, you're in power for 10 years, and then someone else takes over. Uh, if you're a leader uh, in uh, the president of China, after five years, whoever is going to be the next leader becomes vice president, and so you know where your succession lies. There is no succession plan for Xi Jinping. Uh, it seems evident he plans to stay in power for a lot longer, and there are uh, there is concern about that within the Chinese system, uh, of not only just from other factions, but uh, generally about what this means for China and what this means for its stability in the long run. So. So leadership issues continue to be a, uh, an issue for China. So what are, what are the implications of all this? I wanted to just to round this off very quickly. Uh, I talked about supply chain resilience and the need for we look to be looking at uh, not just China but other sources of supply. Um, the, the changes that are happening in Asia uh, for our international trade, uh, not only with China but with other parts of Asia, the importance of work and innovation, elder care, all these issues, middle class needs, urban issues, construction, clean energy, water management, in addition to selling energy and stuff to our, our resources, China and Asia, all these all these areas are very, very important and, and areas where we could be focusing on. Um, and then um, I think there's also a need for a, a whole coherent strategy for, for trade with Asia, not just for trade, but for our approach with Asia as a whole. Uh, we have these challenges with China. Um, and uh, so there's lots of talk of diversification. Now, I find that very interesting because the diversification isn't done by governments. It's done by the private sector. They decide to diversify. They decide to where they're going to take their, 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 their marketing interests and where they're going to go. But I think the role of a government is to, is to uh, create an environment for this. And so that should be looking more at ASEAN countries, looking at our trade relationship with Japan and focusing on that more, creating more of an environment through the the Trans-Pacific Partnership to, um, to to strengthen our trade with the region through these trade agreements, and I'm inviting Taiwan to join this because right now uh, uh, Taiwan is not only economically important to China, big to Canada. It, there's a lot of potential in the relationship, but it needs our support. And generally, strengthening our with Asian institutions like uh, ASEAN and uh, APEC and organizations that we don't take that seriously as much as we should because. Policymakers in uh, in Ottawa tend still to be focused on Europe and still to look at Asia and China as boutique foreign policies. Final things, comments, thoughts on this: decoupling is not realistic. Um, we have to keep uh, trade with China. Global Canada with China will continue to to grow and to be there, but we could be doing more. At the same time, we still remain vulnerable to capricious international actions. Uh, as I mentioned, no political engagement on big ticket items of China. What we need is a sort of relationship that's based on strategic, coordinated, and tough-mindedness as we deal with with the uh, with the country, people that understand China. But we need to identify where our interests lie, and not where our our hearts lie with with China. And, and uh, finally, I think at the same time we can have a really bad relationship with China. But as I've said, there are a tremendous number of very difficult global issues in which China plays an important role. And in any global issue now, China is a key player. So. Uh, climate change, of course, uh, a rules-based system, whatever we can do with China to uphold this, uh, health infectious diseases, uh, uh, um, trans, you know, uh, other, uh, well, these are some issues, but there's so many global issues we need to deal with, we able to, need to be able to essentially walk and chew gum at the same time. Thank you very much. I've gone on too long, and I'll now uh, go back to uh, the, uh, I'll end my presentation now. Thank you.
Awesome. That's a great presentation, Phil. Thank you very much. I wish there was a way we could all applaud. <laughs> oh, there's a clap feature. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, so I guess uh, the next set uh, uh, stage of the, the talk is going to be opening up to questions. Um, what I'd like to do is, is just uh, initially start with a question that I've got related to uh, a Prince George perspective. And uh, Jacqueline Haller is going to be um, uh, fielding questions. So if anyone has a question, if you click on the chat box and you type in a question, uh, Jacqueline's going to be reviewing those and uh, and stick handling those for the rest of the talk. So I guess I guess I'll start with um, uh, a question I've got. Let me just see if I can quickly figure out how to share a uh, screen here, just to, to give some context here. Yeah. All right. Can you see that screen all right? Awesome. Yeah, that was just a bit of a context. This is one of the slides that we we uh, prepared leading up to the talk, and what we want to do is just highlight at very very basic levels some of the major categories of experts for for both uh, uh, Canada and um, and China. Here I'll build up a little bit. And so so basically, uh, I really want to start the conversation with a topic that affects people here in Prince George. And drawing your attention to the infographic on the screen, uh, this compares Canada's largest export to China with China's largest export to Canada. And data comes from BC Stats and for the year 2019. And you'll notice that the largest export Canada sent to China in 2019 was pulp products. A lumber came in at the number four position at $975 million. So in total, China bought 300 or $3.43 billion of pulp and wood products from us that year. Now, I should also mention that in 2018, the largest export to China was in agricultural products, things like soy, cola, and pork, uh, generating sales of roughly $3.55 billion. However, after the detention of Meng Wanzhou, China stopped buying these products from us on at least uh, overall. And so speaking as someone whose local economy depends heavily on the forestry sector, how should we be preparing for the next time that China gets offended by something that we do? Uh, what should we start doing today? And are there any good examples that you can share with us? And I'll just uh, pass that back to you then. Thanks. Uh, that's, a really, that's a good question. And I think this gets back to what I was saying a bit toward the end of my presentation. Um, I, the, we have been uh, focused on the China market uh, in, in both uh, uh, governments and the private sector for a long time. Uh, we put a lot of resources into it, and, and we tend to have tended to put our eggs in one basket, essentially, sometimes with this. And I think that the answer to this, to your question, would be, um, uh, you know, we, we would go get back to diversification. If you're concerned about being more vulnerable to uh, the, the, the sector being vulnerable to, to China, uh, China's behavior, um, then I think that it really is important to be looking at where other markets are. For these products, and and I give an example because I was in Thailand for, um, as you mentioned, for three years, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. One of my biggest challenges there was to get uh, not only sometimes the federal government, but also also the private sector interested in Thailand. Um, and I remember when I was coming back to BC, um, I was on one of my own one of my outreach trips. I went to uh, look at uh, I went to stop at the uh, uh, deal with some the forest products council and and said look um you know i know we're selling wood pulp and we're selling a lot of pulp to thailand but there's a you know we're being uh, new zealand is selling a lot of uh, of lumber to thailand for building uh, uh, pallets and for other things and and we could do a, and there's a lot of construction going on we could do a lot of work um, a lot of good if we uh you know, uh, worked with building standards as well, and we there's a tremendous amount of growth taking place at the time there was. Um, Thailand has a lot of money, uh, a lot of people, booming middle class that wants to uh, have new housing. So, uh, so, uh, so I, I sort of walked them through that, and the person I talked to wasn't interested at all. Uh, I said, "You're traveling to Asia next month. Why don't you just pop over to Thailand? We'll set up a one-day program for you uh, in, in Bangkok, and we'll." Uh, explore this and um, he uh, it never happened so 
you know, uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there that I think we could be doing more with in terms of uh, not being uh, um, uh, as dependent on this one on this one market. And it looks gets back to diversification. It gets back to um, uh, being aware of what the political dynamics are as well, and and hauling loads very carefully because if you're aware of what's going on. Uh, you might be able to anticipate some of the demands, some of the changes, uh, shifts that are going to happen. But uh, it's a tough question because, as I said, China has the capacity to, to respond in a way that the Canadian system doesn't and to respond politically at, at times. So that's uh, and in a way that we've only seen the U.S. doing you know, in recent years. So um, the, the, I think the solution is not going to change what China is doing. You have to be looking at, at, at a more diversified uh, international market. Profile. Very good. Thank you very much. Now, Jacqueline, I'm not sure how you want to, if, if maybe you yeah. could, uh, take on take on the questions and stick handle it from here. Sure, and uh, I can I can just go ahead and read the questions that have appeared in the chat so far. Sure. And I'll just do that in order. Um, so the first question is from Dave, and it's a set of linked questions. Um, will China's rise be peaceful in the long term? Oh, sorry, it just scrolled away from me. More mm -hmm. questions are coming in, which is great. What is the critical underlying root factor for China that will determine if they rise peacefully or not? And I think what, what Dave's really getting at is what should we be worried about, if anything? Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, will China's rise be peaceful? Uh, I think it depends on how you identify what China's rise is and, and how it... How it uh, uh, what what is involved? What is involved? There are some, I think, uh, points of friction. Uh, China has has uh, has become, uh, in terms of China's rise, has become a much more powerful country. Um, it has extended its influence in, in a lot more areas. Um, but um, you know, there, there are certain parts of how China sees the world uh, can cause us concern. I think some of the things we have to be worrying about is that as China becomes more powerful. And as nationalism grows in China, what will it do about Taiwan? Um, you know, I've just been reading actually, uh, um, or, or there are just, there's discussions about the Thucydides trap, where China's rise, the rise of a new power, inevitably uh, lead to conflict with an existing power. And many, many people talk about examples in history about that. So um, I don't think it necessarily needs to happen, but. Uh, um, I think um, whether China's rise is peaceful or not uh, has to do with our understanding of China, our understanding of its motives, and how uh, we respond to China. When when uh, the rest of the world knows to respond in a firm manner, and when the rest of the world needs to respond in a more uh, uh, in a manner that involves uh, conciliation and negotiation. Um, and until we, and, and that will determine the, how the world will unfold in the next uh, in the next uh, twenty years as China continues to take a prominent place in the world. Thank you. Uh, in a similar vein, Beth asks, could Mr. Calvert please comment on recent developments in Hong Kong? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm very concerned about Hong Kong, uh, and, and the you know I actually. Uh, I was in uh, uh, in my first posting in Beijing was when the Hong Kong talks were going on, uh, and that was Deng Xiaoping that was was still leader. And at the time in '84, he said that um, you know, the goal is uh, of the the, the uh, one country two systems policy is peaceful unification with Hong Kong and Taiwan and China into one big country, uh, you know, one big all of us united together. And that's, this can take a hundred years if it needs to, uh, but we don't want we, we we have to do it right. And so um, the Hong Kong agreement and the Hong Kong the basic law and the um, uh, under which it operated uh, the agreement with China. One of the goals of that was to demonstrate that you can operate one country two systems and it can operate well, and Hong Kong could have its degree of autonomy and uh, that this would be an example for Taiwan and, may, and reassure Taiwan that under uh, a unified kind of one country, two systems, Taiwan could continue to function. 
Now, this was the concept back in the 80s. Um, uh, so, so my concern about uh, about Hong Kong is, well, at many levels. One is that China has violated an international agreement. Uh, it says something again about uh, uh, where the rule of law uh, clashes with interests. Um, that you know, tr trumps it. it. It violates an international agreement. It is another reflection of uh, Xi Jinping's moving moving away from some of Deng Xiaoping's. Uh, uh, strictures, uh, which involve not only, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the kind of economic reforms, but also keep a little profile internationally, keep, you know, uh, uh, gradually expand your influence, but don't have these kinds of big confrontations. Of course, and then they had a war with Vietnam, but that's another story. Um, uh, and then, uh, so, so that, where I'm, I'm, that worries me a lot. It worries me that if there's not a firm response from the um, uh, the global community that it sends the uh, message to China that this we're just, this can just happen, and that uh, we're therefore going to respond less less vigorously to other kinds of initiatives. And it worries me, frankly, from a human rights perspective, what happens to all these people who have been uh, the people who have been demonstrating, the people who have the capacity to speak out, restrictions and growing restrictions on freedom of expression and everything. All of these are very worrying, and and I don't know where this is going to head. And frankly, and also another part of the Hong Kong situation has been the national security law uh, includes its extraterritorial application. So in theory, because right now on this broad, you know, on this broadcast and I've written in print, I've been critical of the national security law. In theory, um, if I were to travel to Hong Kong, I could be arrested under that law because it's applied extraterritorially and not just to citizens of China. So that's that's a huge concern. That's a, that's a huge kind of leap in application of law. And I think that's something we should all be worried about. Thank you. Zach asks, uh, are you able to speak to the role Canadian higher education institutions play in China-Canada relations? Should we be facilitating more outgoing exchanges or should we welcome back Confucius Institutes? <laughs> that's a, that's a, uh, a lot of issues to unpack there. Uh, let's start with Confucius Institutes. Uh, one of the things that worries me about um, about uh, the current discourse on China is that it's black and white. So Confucius Institute's bad, uh, uh, you know, and therefore they should be gone. That's kind of a wonderful, uh, uh, um, you know, that's like the, the, the sort of some of the common discourse right now. And there are, are issues with certain behavior of certain Confucius Institutes. Um, on the other hand, we we lack why the Confucius Institutes are are having a presence here is because we have lacked investment in institutional capacity, as mentioned earlier, to teach uh, Mandarin, to teach Chinese, to teach um, uh, uh, about China, in, in, you know, across the board. I mean, it, it, we are lacking, lagging behind on this. Confucius Institutes, which of course are, you know, ex extensions of Chinese soft power, have the capacity to do this. So, so from from my, from my view, uh, when Confucius Institutes are teaching language. Uh, and can can play this role uh, and limit limit themselves to these kinds of activities. Um, it's fine. The problem with some Confucius Institutes, particularly in the United States, is small colleges have have, have uh, you know have engaged Confucius Institutes to teach Chinese studies, uh, which of course then has a different whole perspective on Tiananmen and other uh, uh, and other uh, issues. So uh, human rights. So. You can't have that, but I think if you can keep Confucius Institutes limited, confined to what they're supposed to be doing, and 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 supervised, I think they can play a good role. And a lot of that's what a lot of colleges have said in the last uh, in the last couple of days when the issue's been uh, on the table again. So they really need to be monitored. We need to understand what they're saying and and uh, and what what's being taught there. But I I don't like the idea of writing them off as a whole. Well, there was an early part of that question, if you could just remind me what it is, because I've been babbling on. Yeah, the, the question started with a more general comment on the role that Canadian higher education oh, institutions play in China-Canada relations. And then there yeah. was another part about should we be facilitating more outgoing exchanges for, yes. for our students? Yes. These are really important. I mean, uh, um, um, I think educational exchanges are critical to our understanding of each other. And the more well, not hope the more we have these kinds of exchanges and the more 
changes we have, the more you know, the the, the more we're contributing to global peace, frankly. Um, but um, the challenge is, uh, I think, when universities become overly dependent on, uh, from a revenue point of view, on students from China, as from any, you know, from any country, but particularly from China, because it gets back to the Chinese system having the capacity to turn the tap on and off if they want to, and this this creates some vulnerabilities. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think it's important to have uh, these kinds of educational exchanges. And I, uh, you know, and I, again, thanks for the question, because another thing I want, I would add is that we are really lacking, lagging behind in our international, um, in our, in, in Canadian students going abroad say, to China to study and learn. We're actually doing less now than we were a couple of decades ago. And we're doing less than the United States per capita. We, we just don't have the students are not going abroad to have these international experiences and exchanges the way they would the way they were before and we're not doing it as much as other, as other countries so to me that is very uh, uh, worrying because it creates a sort of insularity and provincialness in our outlook and, and we it, it you know as students become the leaders of tomorrow we want students and people with a, a broad outlook on the world and they're making important decisions for us especially as I get old so, so um, you know, I think these educational exchanges are extremely important. And I would hope, I would really uh, hope the government of Canada would actually put a lot more money into supporting international student exchanges, because I think it's critical that we do this to uh, increase the, the, the ties between us. Fantastic, thanks. Um, Beth had a second question that's popped up now, or popped up after her first, rather. Thanks for the comments, um, Mr. Calvert, yeah. Pardon me? Oh, never mind. I just saw Beth made a comment, too. That was nice. Oh, so, yes. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, um, she asked, could Mr. Calvert also comment on the impact of China's recent strategy of pur purchasing Canadian goods via third parties? Oh, you mean, are, are we talking about uh, 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 canola through the United UAE? Okay. Okay, yeah. So, so that's, I mean... Uh, I, I think it's it's uh, simply uh, you know private sector strategy. You can't get your your canola into China directly, so uh, so let's go through a third party and have it go through UAE. It's a it's a it's a legitimate strategy um, and something that uh, you know has helped the canola farmers. I mean we're we're seeing uh, while there have been some problems with agricultural exports to China and canola, we're seeing a lot of barley exports right now and that sort of thing going straight to China. But, but this, uh, this process through UAE isn't unique. And it's not the first time this has happened. Um, uh, when we, uh, you know that uh, Hong Kong and Macau and uh, have separate kind of uh, customs uh, structures right now. So they're actually more members of the WTO, with se separate, separate customs administrations. Um, so, uh, you know, when if you were to look at a few years ago, we were looking at exports of uh, of beef to uh, to China and to the region. When beef, uh, when we were having trouble, we couldn't get beef into China following the uh, 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 BSE uh, uh, problems we had. This is back in the two thousands, early two thousands, um, and we calculated that every person in Macau was eating. Uh, 50, by eating 50 tons of Canadian beef a year, oh, so it's not 50 tons, 50, 50 pounds of a whole whack of beef anyway, a year. There was so much that was just going through on the gray market. So with Hong Kong, when we we're trying to get beef into China, we went through Hong Kong and, uh, and Macau. And in this case, this was more what they call the gray market, kind of a, a more porous kind of border that somehow uh, Canadian beef ended up in China in hotels. Uh, but um, not directly being sold and not actually openly. So there are a lot of ways that the private sector can uh, work uh, to get around some of these problems. And I think the, uh, the canola one's a good kind of example of creativity. Much better if they could sell it directly. And uh, there have been lots of talks about this uh, over the years. I wanted also to flag a couple of more well, here on agricultural trade issues. A lot of people have mentioned beef and pork. Uh, and not here tonight, today, but as another, other things that were cut off in the wake of uh, of, uh, of the two Michaels and uh, the Meng Wanzhou case. 
Um, I think we also have to be careful that we're, we're we're not jumping to conclusions about some of these uh, some of these uh, uh, developments. In the case of the, the pork issue, uh, there was actually a leg actually a legitimate uh, labeling problem um, and content problem. China bans the use of ractopamine, and uh, we had sent them uh, a company had sent them pork, uh, shipped them pork that, despite what it said on the label, actually contained ractopamine. So China just shut down pork imports while they investigated it. As I said, China desperately needed pork, so that lasted that went by, uh, that was resolved. But also, um, uh, beef had a similar problem. There was actually, a, when you looked at it carefully, there was actually a, a legitimate kind of labeling problem that was solved. So, so when we have these, these trade problems, I think we have to be really careful in identifying what the actual problem is and whether it is political or whether it is uh, an actual trade issue much as we stop imports of things when we're concerned about them. Great. We'll now head into a few questions that are, are political or security focused. Okay. The first is from Ross. And Ross writes, the historical focus of the Canadian Navy has been East Coast European focused. But given the shift underway globally toward the Asia, Asia Pacific region, should the Canadian Navy shift deliberately toward an Asia Pacific focus? China is increasing their Navy significantly. Um, well, first of all, I'd like us just to have, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm glad that we're building up our Navy finally. I just think the, 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 the last few decades of China's, uh, Canada's naval capacity has been uh, you know, absurdly weak. So we need to do a lot more generally. But I, I would agree that uh, um, the areas of sort of uh, naval uh, confrontation, uh, ocean-based confrontation, to me are probably uh, quite likely to be in, in in Asia, especially the South China Seas. And if nothing else, uh, we should be able to be working with other allies and uh, like-minded countries to to um, uh, protect shipping lanes, especially the Straits of Madagascar or the Straits of Malacca. Sorry, um, um, uh, uh, because uh, those are critical to our supplies of our own products of our own imports of energy and other products so yes i think that there's uh, needs to be a lot more focus of on of the navy on on the pacific um let me make do a, a larger issue too actually and i think there needs to be a lot more focus on asia by the canadian government as a whole um uh, i mentioned i threw out i made an offhand comment for the end of uh, the presentation where um Asia, certainly China, is still seen as a boutique kind of foreign policy. Maybe that's changing now, but uh, for many years, you know, uh, we deal with China. We we've dealt with China as a government when it's been a kind of a crisis or, or a prime minister's visit. But um, you know, uh, while Xi Jinping doesn't get up every morning and wonder what uh, what uh, Justin Trudeau has done or said about China, you know, I think that uh, our uh, our political leaders should be, uh, you know, paying a lot more attention to to, to the country, to the region, because uh, this is where the changes are going to take place, and this is where the global order is going to be shifted. So there needs to be a lot more attention to that. Um, uh, the org organizations in Asia, I mentioned institutions, uh, like, uh, for example, APEC, uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, which is a big or uh, a group of uh, of countries, including Canada, the United States, etc. Um, we tend to send uh, fairly junior officials to these meetings, except when we have our have their leaders' meetings. When we used to do that, and we when we used to send people to meetings, uh, much lower level people than we in Australia or New Zealand or certainly China or the Asian countries, and uh, it simply is hard to get attention in uh, global affairs, for example, uh, to the organization because it's not rules based and so it doesn't have any binding decisions, and so. Uh, for those of you, you know, for those of us who deal with Asia, we would say, well, that's kind of the point. Uh, this is an institution, organization that operates differently. It's about it's about norm. It's it's about uh, personal relationships and and meeting people on the side and what kinds of ways you can promote things and promote engagement without actually it being rules based like the WTO because this is this other approach is what a lot of Asian countries are, are more comfortable with. So we should be engaging in this. Um, uh, um, so 
in general, I think it's been a, a real, um, uh, you call it, 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 government's been dragged a bit into, into paying more attention to Asia. I still think that we're not doing as much as we could be. Great. We have about 15 minutes left and we have about five more questions. So I'm actually hopeful we'll be able to get to all of them. I'll give a short answer. And then, well, the next question from Megan is slightly related to where you ended with that last one. You mentioned Canada needs to identify where its interests lie. Where do you think Canada's national interests lie, where trade is part of the integrated whole? And how do we balance those interests when we have two significant trade partners, China and the US, with very different expectations? Is lying low with no significant projects, for example, enough or even in our best interests? Um, that's a, a very good question. Um, <clears throat> in terms of trade interests, uh, I think we have to, first of all, uh, be realistic in the fact and, and, and understand that our, uh, our our trade interests with the United States have to take precedent over everything else. And I know uh, that doesn't mean we ignore other air, other areas or that we we uh, we don't explore other other parts of the world. But this is where our our prosperity depends on the trade relationships. So so that's that's one point. Um, where do Canada's interests lie? Well, our interests lie in protecting ourselves, uh, protecting ourselves from uh, 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 from either cyber, uh, you know, cyber invasions or other uh, security concerns. Our interests lie in uh, extending our, uh, promoting our, uh, supporting our businesses and doing uh, work abroad. Um, and uh, you know, I think that the, the issue, the problem of whether when we have to decide between one or the other. Um, uh, I don't think we're often put in the position of deciding between the United States and other partners. Um, we are, it's kind of a unique situation right now, globally. And, uh, but, uh, and it may be that, uh, depending on what happens over the next four years, the United States um, becomes less of an important player globally. Um, for us, Canada, our, our interests lie, uh, why our interests lie in the United States is because we, are a, uh, a small country, a small population, we need international markets. So the more we can be pursuing international markets without abandoning our, our um, trading relationship with the United States, uh, the, the more important it is for our own prosperity. So I don't know, I don't know if I'm giving a very good answer for that. We are. That's great, thank you. And Steve's question follows nicely on this. Um, Steve says, Sweden declared China a threat to their national security and banned Huawei technologies. Comments? <laughs> um, it's back a bit to what you were, I was saying before from a, from a security point of view. Um, the, Canada is a member of the Five Eyes, as, as you know, uh, and so that's uh, uh, intelligence sharing uh, uh, amongst the uh, United States. Um, uh, the UK, uh, Britain, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, and Canada, uh, and it's intelligence from the United States, and there is intelligence gathering is particularly important to us. So uh, the other four countries have uh, you know, have banned Huawei, and we're just, they're just waiting for us to do it. Our membership in the uh, Five Eyes and what it does for us is more important than. Um, it is more important than you know uh, annoying China over for Huawei. Besides, they're already annoyed with us over Meng Wanzhou. Um, so I think first of all that we should be uh, we should be from my point of view we should be just dis despite what um, Canadian companies are saying about this we should be actually uh, uh, looking at we should be actually announcing a ban on, on Huawei. I suspect a few things that are happening with that right now. One is that. Uh, I'm not making a decision. We're essentially making a decision, and the country, uh, companies are starting to go with uh, other suppliers of 5G technology. But um, secondly, I, I suspect this is held up because there's concern that if we if we make that kind of make a, a, an overt decision against Huawei right now, there may be concern that this will have a further impact on uh, on the two Michaels. I'm not sure that that's the case, but, uh, but that could be what people are thinking about as well. Thank you. Um, now we're going to head back into talking about the strictly economic part of this. 
Ronald asks, what about China's economic recovery? Are they in a better economic position than the USA and Canada? And are they still able to buy Canadian goods and interested and able to buy Canadian goods? If the North American economy tanks, will Chinese buying power save us? Um, okay, a few things. One is, uh, yeah, the, as a, the Chinese economy seems to be at this point, it seems to be coming back, especially in the three big cities, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. So they're, they're because they got into their recovery, uh, to COVID earlier, their recovery started earlier, and they do have a great capacity to mobilize uh, people to, uh, to, to more mobilize the economy and provide tremendous economic support to it quickly parts of the economy to, to stimulate it. So I think a recovery is happening. I'm not sure if a second wave is going to hit China or not. It's really hard to say. But uh, and there has been some economic uh, uh, damage done. And, uh, and so that's a, you know, that, that, that's a, that, that may be a long term or short term. Um, but uh, the other thing is, uh, we don't know is China's employment figures. We know what China says its employment figures are. And its unemployment is about five percent right now. Uh, I suspect it's a lot higher, and I suspect in some of the smaller cities and areas, smaller areas, it is a significant challenge, and that is uh, a challenge to, uh, to the leadership because um, you know that's uh, that's a stability issue. Um, so, um, and I think with respect to buying Canadian products, in fact, they have been buying Canadian products uh, uh, this year as uh, they. they uh, uh, their purchase of Canadian products are about at the same level as it was this time, or in mid-July of 2020, the level of purchase of Canadian products was about the same amount as it was in 2019. So this is in the midst of an economic crisis. Um, they are still purchasing Canadian products. I think it reflects the fact that China will purchase products when they need to and, uh, and uh, when, when, it's, when it's in their interest to do so. Thanks. On a related note, how essential, this is Brooks's question, how essential are Chinese international students for BC's provincial economy and development? Mm, that's a good question. I, I'm afraid I don't have that at hand. Uh, I know that uh, anecdotally that they play an important role in the, in the um, uh, income and, uh, for universities and colleges. Uh, and other parts of the school system in, in British Columbia, uh, but I don't have a real, a really good sense of what exactly that means. It actually, it'd be a good thing to ask uh, someone in charge of UNBC because they'd have a good idea. Thanks. Um, now there's a question from John about the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. China's expansion and influence have greatly expanded through the Belt and Road Initiative. How should Canada be responding? The influence can easily be seen and felt in places like Cambodia, parts of Africa, along the borders of India, etc. Well, um, in theory, the Belt and Road Initiative is open to other countries to, to participate in, from countries from other countries, and it's not really happening that much, although we have expressed interest in being part of this. Um, I think, um, in general, first of all, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, is, is some of the construction is happening and some of it is, uh, is uh, um, aspirational. Uh, where Canada can play a role, I think, is actually just by uh, maybe early on paying more attention to some of the areas where the Belt and Road Initiative is, is taking place. Because the reason they're accepting, the reason they're interested in, uh, in the BRI, in, in some of these projects, is not because they are necessarily embracing China. Uh, a, a number of countries, say in Southeast Asia, are concerned about China's influence. They're concerned about the role China plays in their but they don't have many, see they have many other choices. And China is able to come along with uh, less expensive funding sometimes and to build on these projects. Strategically to respond to Belt and Road Initiative, Canada and other countries need a program um, of investment themselves, and uh, uh, this is something to help. Something to help Canadian companies could be done through what used to be Exceda through Global Affairs, um, through some maybe our Canada's Infrastructure Investment Bank tends to be focused on Canada. But um, what I believe we need is a strategic approach to to uh, 
to, to this because we're looking at influence and uh, extending our influence as well as just extending uh, business ties. So uh, it would be. So what is needed is a, a, a interest in um, our own you know, developing our own, paying attention to these countries and the projects they need, seeing what we can do in terms of better financing. Uh, to support them, and then uh, working with them, working with, with our Canadian companies and others to to you know, compete on with some of, with the China on some of these projects. It's very difficult, but um, there's a certain resistance. And I'll tell you because, for example, I was also ambassador to Lao, and at one point I met, I think it was the Lao minister of uh, in charge of hydropower. He was uh, uh, he was. Uh, are urging me to get Canadian companies out to 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 allow to uh, to engage in some of the work we used to do with respect to the construction of drams and hydropower facilities and things like that. Lao really wants to build up their hydropower capacity because they believe that's the ticket to industry to development. They have a lot of water resources to sell the power uh, to to Asia, other parts of Asia, and they'll get rich or let's get not not so poor. Um, so they, he's really interested. In Canadian companies, Canadian capacity to come out and do this, and and he said, the reason is he said because we we uh, know China is the one that's there, and we'd rather do business with Canada than China anytime. We just don't see you out here on the mining side in Cambodia. Uh, uh, you know, there's uh, mineral. There are a lot of there's a lot of interest in mineral development in Cambodia. Uh, the comp the company that always the Chinese the Canadian Cambodian government always raised with me was a Canadian company that was paid a great deal of attention to um, to uh, uh, the needs of the people where the mine was being developed. In other words, uh, corporate social responsibility. That wasn't the kind of stuff where they say hey, we're going to you know buy you school uniforms or something kind of dumb like that. But it was let's go into the community. What do you need? How how can we train the people to work on this mine? What are your environmental concerns? How do you uh, how do we develop this in such a way that it's sustainable uh, for your people? What else could we do to to for your village? You know, as we're doing this mine and and that sort of thing. So it was a genuinely uh, a genuine commitment to corporate social responsibility, and that's that's kind of, that could be Canada's brand uh, in the region uh, if we were to do engage seriously on some of these projects because when push comes to shove. Um, uh, unless uh, you know, there's a great deal of interest in it. There's a great deal, a great deal of interest in responsible development, and these countries are very much aware of it. And what keeps uh, uh, what keeps them going back to China is first of all the cheap money, and also to a certain extent uh, a certain level of uh, corruption as well. Thank you. Well, we're at 127, so we have one question left, and I'm hoping we can get through it. Um, Mervyn, who has a personal connection to the family of one of the Michaels, asks, has Canada tried hard enough for the re release of the two Michaels? Could more be done? Well, that's a, you know, that's, that's a half hour question. Uh, but also, uh, um, you know, the whole Meng Wanzhou question is, it, it's, it's, you've seen the debate in the papers and it's become very polarized. You know, we should be there, we should let them go. Some one side saying we should just let her go. Other side saying we have to hold, hold uh, let Meng Wanzhou go so that two Michaels be released. The other side saying that we should be, you know, hang on, we should uh, hold tight. Um, so it depends on whether or not you believe that Canada should be actually um, releasing Meng Wanzhou uh, in order to get them back because uh, clearly that's a connection and clearly if Canada did that um, if they negotiated well and, and, and you know undertook that then they would uh, then the Meng Wanzhou would probably be released uh, is Canada doing enough I think uh, uh, we could have had an, a reaction a lot quicker a lot faster perhaps in putting more pressure on China in other ways um, I'm uh, surprised that uh, at the very beginning for example uh, government of Canada didn't say, uh, didn't talk about when we talk about the Huawei application for 5G. Didn't say simply say we're not even going to look at Huawei's application while Michael Spavor and Michael Calvary are in prison. We're not even going to look at it. So if you really want to do something in, in, in Canada, Huawei, you go and talk to Xi Jinping since you guys are close anyway. Um, so making use of these connections, uh, hurting, you know, actually doing some some um, 
uh, pressure on Chinese companies in Canada. Uh, we have to kind of, if we're going to put pressure on China, if we're not going to do the negotiation of Meng Wanzhou's release, then we're going to have to be putting pressure on Chinese companies in such a way that they start going back to Xi Jinping and saying, what the hell is going on? Why, why can't we, why are we having problems with Canada? I think that's the only way we can be actually working to, 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 to push her release uh, if we're going to not, or to push their release if we're not going to negotiate a separate package. That was two minutes. That was perfect. Thank you. And thank you for your thoughtful answers to all of these many questions. I think the number and the depth of these questions really testifies to this uh, presentation and its quality. Sean, I'll turn it over to you to close us out as our president. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Jacqueline. Yeah, some excellent questions. And I, I my mind's with uh, all the all the various uh, uh, ways you can you can sort of uh, extract extrapolate this out. Uh, on, on that last point regarding uh, using pressure on the expansion of companies in China is not something I've heard much of. So it's an interesting uh, point to end things out. Uh, yeah, let me just say, Phil, this has been awesome. I really enjoyed this talk. Uh, enjoyed it. I had a great time. Yeah, I think I think this is a great way to kick off uh, CIC Prince George. And uh, I get just a couple few uh, housekeeping notes. Um, I'd also like to give a special thanks to uh, CIC Victoria. They've been very supportive in getting us up. In particular, Chris Kilford has been excellent in uh, in mentoring us as we uh, navigate these new waters. And um, and in particular, uh, there's there's uh, some upcoming talks Chris has. Uh, I think there's one next week, October 27th. If anyone's interested, they should check out the CIC.org for upcoming uh, talks. And uh, I guess there's a, a book draw we've got to announce a winner for. So I um, did a random draw during the event and uh, and came up with Diane Feng. Uh, so she gets a copy, signed copy of Claws of the Panda, and I'll reach out to her through email and send it along. And I guess as a final uh, plea, if you're interested in CIC and CIC Prince George, uh, please sign up. We're looking to recruit members and really eager to expand the branch here. So all you have to do is visit the CIC.org and you go to sign up, become a member and select the Prince George branch. And uh, yeah, we're interested to hear your opinions too. I think uh, on that note, uh, just a final thank you, Phil. And uh, I'll face you in about half an hour, just uh, more questions. And um, yeah, thank you, everyone. I think this has been a, a successful first event. So best of luck to everyone. Look forward to seeing you next sure. time. Bye. Bye.